You know, in the midst of beginning a new year and uh, people making all kinds of resolutions, people uh, desiring this fresh start, other people desiring to forget the past, I'd like to suggest to you this morning <clears throat> to just for a moment stop all of your planning and your personal goal setting just long enough to realize that God has his own plans for you. And that's the name of today's sermon, is God's got plans for you. How do we know? Well, he tells us so. Look at Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You know, Jeremiah was prophesying that promise of God to the nation of Israel, his people, the people of God. And although this particular promise was given in 600 B.C. and intended for those who had been taken captive by the Babylonians, I'm here to tell you this morning, God's message to his people has not changed in 2,600 years. For the people of God today, those who are held by him through faith in Christ, the crux of God's message is exactly the same. The Lord has not forgotten his people. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And listen, God's prophecy can be for us today, and it holds the same assurance that it held in, in Jeremiah's day for those people, and that is that God's got plans for us. Which means if you're a child of God, then this promise that we just read in Jeremiah is for you. 600 B.C., or 2016 A.D., it matters not to a God who is eternal. So let me reinforce this once again who his children are. John 1, 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You know, the first testament, the one we call the Old Testament, is not to be treated as though it's irrelevant or outdated or somehow has been replaced by the New Testament. As a matter of fact, so many of God's promises made to his people in the Old Testament are very much relevant for us today. 1 Corinthians 1.20, Paul reinforces that to us. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. So let's look at God's promise to us that he chose to speak through the prophet Jeremiah. It has four components. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope, plans to give you a future. Well, we plainly see that God has plans to prosper, not harm, to give us hope and give us a future. All pretty good stuff, isn't it? Now, I'm not going to speak individually to those four components today. Instead, I'd like to address the one reoccurring theme that we read in the promise that Jeremiah has written. And he, and he wrote three times the word plans. I want to emphasize again, God has plans for us. The word plans in Hebrew, mahashiva. And it means a purpose or a thought. But specifically, more specifically, here's what it also means. It means a project. A project that someone is working on. We are God's mahashiva. We're his project. Each one of us are his project, one that he has great plans for, a project that he has a purpose for. We're the project that God is working on. Now, here's two things you need to know about every plan of God for his people. Every plan that he has for us will, one, be for our ultimate good, and two, be for his glory. And the thing about God's plans for you and me, he doesn't force us to fulfill any one of them. He presents them to us. He tells us what they're going to do for us. They're going to prosper us. They're not going to harm us. They're going to give us a future, and they're going to give us hope. And it's up to us to either fulfill them or ignore them. Now, I've chosen an account out of the book of Luke to demonstrate how the Lord will first get our attention, and then second, what we can come to expect as God begins to unfold the plans he has for us. There are certain characteristics so here we go, Luke 5, this is 1 through 11. Bear with me. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, 
with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night long and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Well, these guys, these these disciples that Jesus called, they were just men. They were just young men, teenagers, as a matter of fact, for the most part. Not mature, well-versed in the Scriptures, religious scholars. And they didn't hold any amazing faith. They were fishermen. Their two biggest problems probably of the day, find a way to feed my family and to kind of cope or deal with this Roman oppression. This was not their first encounter with Jesus, but it did mark the beginning of their commitment to Christ. Take note. There has to be a conscious commitment to Christ on our part before we can begin to fulfill the plans that God has for us. This particular day, they weren't looking for Jesus. They were just doing something all of us do or have done all our lives, trying to make a living. These guys were just trying to catch some fish. Scripture tells us they were finished for the day, washing their nets. They were probably looking forward to going home, putting their feet up, just relaxing. Here comes Jesus, walking smack dab into their lives again. It really wasn't a convenient time for them. The first characteristic of the Lord and his plans is that he tends to show up at the most inconvenient times. You ever notice that? Usually when we don't have the time, we're too busy. We got stuff to do. We got life to live. He shows up with plans when we don't have the energy. I'm tired. You know, I did all that stuff when I was younger. He'll show up when we don't really feel like listening because we know this is probably going to be somewhat uncomfortable, probably going to require that dreaded word, change. But here's the truth. The Lord shows up exactly on time, every time. His timing is perfect. And his timing is always with a purpose. I'd say the vast majority of us in here know what it's like for the Lord to show up at an inconvenient time. And if we're truthful, chances are we probably weren't too excited when he did. But when the Lord shows up in our lives, it is with a purpose. The purpose is to confront us. So God, he confronts us. He calls us. And he does it to get our attention. Simon, Tom, Lisa, Mike, Debbie, Reed. See, he makes it it personal. God always makes it personal. He never says, hey, you. He calls us by name. Because that's who our God is. He's a personal God, so he makes it personal. And when he calls us, we can give him our attention. Or if we're doing at the time what we rather would be doing, we might ignore him. However, I've discovered this, brothers and sisters. The problem with ignoring him is we can only do it for so long. Eventually, he's going to get our attention. God's going to find a way to get us to listen. Now, what we do after that, that's strictly up to us. But he's not going to allow us to use this as an excuse later on. Oh, if I had only known it was you, God, that was trying to get my attention. Uh Uh-uh. No. So then this means what? 
Well, this means if he has to, God will allow us to get to a place where we're more apt to listen. Maybe a hospital bed. Maybe in a recovery program. Maybe in the unemployment line. Maybe at the funeral of a loved one. Maybe, maybe with divorce staring you in the face. The question I'm asking you this morning is, does God have your attention? Have you given him your ear? Are you willing to listen? You see, once God shows up, once he confronts us, and we give him our attention, we let him know, hey, we're ready, God, we're ready to listen. Then the third thing he does, the Lord will test us. He tests our willingness. He'll test our obedience to follow him. See, Jesus, Jesus just got into Simon's boat. He didn't ask him, right? Hey, Simon, is it okay? If, no, he, he got into the boat. And here's what he said, Simon, I want you to put out a little from shore. You see, the Lord's task might be something small, might even be something that seems insignificant, easy to do. But there's a reason that he does that. See, God will give us that one talent. That initial responsibility wants to see what we're going to do with it. Obey him, invest it, or, and use it for his glory, or squander it, hoard it, or do nothing with it. The master speaking to the two servants that he entrusted with the five talents and the two talents, right after they did something with them, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. See, it pleased the master that they took what he had given them and invested it. And once we prove worthy of the one talent and it pleases God, then God does what God does. He stretches us. Fourth thing, God's remarkably good at stretching us, isn't he? So after the two servants and Jesus' parable proved worthy, then he followed up. He said, you've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. It's exactly what he did with Simon, right? Simon, I want you to put out a little bit from shore. Simon did. Well, next, Simon, put out into deep water and then let down your nets. Take note. It's not by the shore where remarkable things are done for the Lord. It's in the deep water. Truth is, there's lots of people waiting around in the shallow waters of faith. You know why? Because it's safe by the shore. No sharks by the shore. No chance of getting in over your head by the shore. By the shore, we're one or two steps away from the security of the land. See, there's not much trust needed right next to the shore. But the problem is when we stay close to the shore, we're more apt to rely upon our own abilities there, right? You know why? Because we don't have to operate out of faith. Trust isn't really a big factor. But here's the problem. It's not where God wants us. He showed Simon. Simon, you're not going to catch a lot of fish right here in the shallow water. So once God stretches us by pointing us out into the deep water, he waits once again for our response. We can ignore him. We can obey him. Either one, right? The choice is ours. God has given us that choice. And look what Peter does. It's not much different from what we do at all, right? Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night long. We haven't caught anything. But because... You say so. Probably rolled his eyes there, huh? Because you say so, I guess we'll have to do it. Although Simon didn't want to, and although Simon had a good excuse, Simon still obeyed the Lord. Brothers and sisters, take note. When God shows up and he calls us, when God tests us and he stretches us, even though we have what we determine to be the greatest excuse in the world, my advice is to obey him anyway. And here's why. Isaiah tells us. 
As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, even though we don't see it, it's best just to trust him anyway. In verse 6, And when they had done so, obeyed him, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Here's the next thing I want you to see. Obedience is met with blessing. And more often than not, that blessing exceeds our expectations. Look at Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. You want to know why God's blessing exceeds our expectations? Because he wants us to know it's him doing it. He wants us to know it's not us, it's not our good deeds, it's not our own abilities. You remember the story of, of Gideon in the Mennonites, right? God had called him. He said, what are you calling me for? My clan's the least in all of Israel, and I'm the least in my clan. Well, then he, he went forth in obedience, had 32,000 men, armed men with him. He said, God, that's not enough. God said, that's too many. He needed more, he got less. Isn't that like God? You know why? Because there's safety in numbers. God said, not 32,000. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you 300. 300. 32,000 is not enough, you're going to give me 300. He said, that's right. You know why, Gideon? Because I want everyone to know it's me doing it. See, you and God are a majority Every single time, regardless the number the enemy has or what obstacle you might be facing in your life. And God blesses our obedience. You know why? Because he wants to encourage us. He wants to motivate us. He wants us to keep on obeying him. It's called positive reinforcement. See, the Lord knows how difficult it is to live out our faith in this depraved and corrupt and degenerate world. So he emboldens us. And then he assures us, no, ma no matter how deep the waters might be running, I'm with you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Ever. You see, God, the truth of God is that he never wants us ever to think that we're ever alone. Ever. So here's what he does on our behalf. Sixth thing. He gives us one another. Verse 7, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Here's a fact. We need one another. And here's why. God created us that way. He said in Genesis 2, 18, it is not good for the man to be alone. You know, I hear people tell me, you know, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I tell them, no. But you do if you want to live as a Christian. <clears throat> Hebrews 10.25 tells us, let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. And the best way to encourage someone is to be there with them and to be there for them. See, that's one of the main purposes of the church of Jesus Christ. God calls us, the church, his body. And 1 Corinthians tells us, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. See, when body parts are missing, the body suffers. Now, when obedience is displayed and we demonstrate the willingness to come alongside one another, it's such an amazing thing to watch as God does his thing and pours out his blessings among us, right? When Simon Peter saw this, that the boats began to sink because they were so filled with fish. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. God's blessings are so astounding 
that we have to come to realize that it's not us doing it. And then if it's not us doing it, that leaves only one thing. God himself has done it. Simon and his friends saw this catch of fish was not normal, not natural. This catch of fish was miraculous, and it astounded them. Look at Gideon's outcome. He wanted more than 32,000. He got 300. Now go stand and fight the army, or at least go stand and watch me fight the army, God said. And that's exactly what he did. They stood and watched as the army tore themselves apart. Not one sword had to be drawn. Gideon, it wasn't me, right? Peter, it wasn't me. See, that's what God does. God takes our natural. He adds his super to it. And then it becomes supernatural. And when we realize that, when we get an up-close and personal view of the Lord and what He is truly capable of and we see it in comparison to what we're able to do, then we begin to feel our own sinfulness, our own unworthiness next to God's holiness and His perfect righteousness, and it convicts us and it humbles us beyond anything we've ever experienced before. Look at Simon, his reaction. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. He wasn't the only one. Look at Genesis 18. Abraham, aware of being in God's presence for the very first time at the burning bush. I am nothing but dust and ashes. Job, once he sits in the presence of his creator, my eyes have seen you, therefore I despise myself. Isaiah, when God's presence shook the pillars, filled the temple with smoke, woe is me, I'm, a, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. You see, once, once we see the Lord for who he is and what he's capable of doing, we simultaneously see our own wretched selves for who we are and the limitations of what we are incapable of doing. And it shames us, appalls us, embarrasses us, but then God shows up, doesn't he? And he comforts us. He reassures us in the only way God can do that, as he did with Simon. He said, don't be afraid. The truth is we should never be afraid of the Lord. Respect him, be in awe of him, marvel, of course, at him, but never be afraid. He tells us not to, right? I read it at the beginning because his plans for us do not harm us. They actually prosper us. They give us hope. They give us a future. Brothers and sisters, for God indeed has a purpose, a purpose for using you, using your life. And when the Lord shows up and he confronts us, he tests us, he stretches us, he lets us know that we're not alone and we trust him. Ultimately, here's what God does. Then, then God will reveal to us the plans he has for us. He gives us a purpose for our lives. From now on, Simon, you will be fishers of men. God wants us to see that our lives aren't really about us. Our lives are about his kingdom. The kingdom he wants us to play a major role in. Here's a news flash. This congregation here at Church of the Rock is not the only people God desires to have dwell in his kingdom. But I will tell you this, that God wants to use the congregation here at Church of the Rock to help bring all those others in. And lastly, here's what I want you to see this morning. God's plan for us, his purpose for our lives, takes amazing faith and tremendous commitment. Don't let these last 13 words of verse 11 slip by your spiritual ears this morning. After all this had taken place, here's what the fishermen, here's what they did. So they pulled their boats up on shore 
They left everything and followed him. Yeah, physically, they pulled their boats up on shore. Spiritually, they pulled their lives up on shore. They didn't leave them in the water. They couldn't because they had a new direction. They had a new plan, a new purpose in life. Does this mean they never fished again? No. They still had to make a living. Here's something I want you to know. God wants you to make a living, right? But the significance of this was fishing for fish was no longer the primary purpose in life. No longer would physical possessions be more important than their spiritual possessions. Remember, they left everything, and that included two boatloads of fish. Listen, you might be just wanting to live out your life. Peace, no drama, no confrontations, no more deep sea fishing. You like your life. You're comfortable with where you're at right now. The truth is, so was Moses. Tending sheep, minding his own business. I want you to go to Pharaoh and deliver my people. Paul, living life large and in charge, a Pharisee of Pharisees, had the cash and the clout. The Lord changed the direction of his life, and he sent him to all people, witness to the Gentiles. The disciples, fishing, making a living, When Jesus showed up and totally transformed their lives, he transformed their lives with the plans he had for them. My question to you this morning, has the Lord recently shown up in your life? Maybe it was a really inconvenient time. Have you been a little bit too busy to notice? Has he called out your name to get your attention? Is he making it personal? Has he challenged you? Asking maybe for you to put out into some deeper waters. Maybe fear has struck you, overwhelmed you. Just remember, you have a spiritual family by your side who will come alongside you and assist you. Are you hesitant? Because you're not sure what this is going to mean for your life. <clears throat> Changes are difficult. But my suggestion to you this morning, the first thing that you need to do, you need to pull your boat up on shore. Quit trying to live God's life for you with your boat still in the water. So what is your boat? What needs pulled up and dry docked? Some addiction? A job? Maybe a person or a group of people? What is keeping you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life? It just might be you. I really enjoyed this time of meditation this morning and reflection. I need to do more of that. I think we all could use a little bit more reflection, right? You know, these young fishermen, they weren't any different than us. But they left it all for something far better. Are we willing to leave our past and include Christ in the present and live our future for the Lord. No excuses. I can't. I I don't think I'm able. I'm not ready. I need this, that, or the other. No excuses. And here's why. Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Quit trying to think that you have to do it yourself. You know, the the, the beginning of a, a new year really is 
in God's kingdom doesn't really mean a whole lot. I mean, he, I don't think he, he operates by calendar or clock, right? But for us, it, it, can, it can signal or signify new beginnings. What great new beginnings. To begin to commit your life more deeply to Christ. To begin to listen more. Less excuses. More acceptance of him. More fellowship with one another. There's so many plans that God has for us to operate in his kingdom together. So what I'd like you to do, <clears throat> some of you may have made New Year's resolutions. Some of you may have written down some goals for you this coming year. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want you to go back over them and read them again and read them with this thought in mind. How will this bring glory to God? If it will, by all means, do whatever you can to fulfill it. But if it, if it won't, if it's to bring personal glory, my suggestion is to scrap it and write a new one with him in mind. Would you pray with me? Father, you've given us a day. You've given us the morning. You've given us the evening. And you tell us that there are things that can be new in our lives, just like your mercies are new to us, Lord, every morning. So, Lord, my prayer is for each and every one of us to, to truly reflect and to focus on goals, to focus on on things that we would love to see happen this year, but, but with you in mind. To think before we write one or to begin to accomplish one, Lord, how will this bring my Father glory? Thank you, Lord. And I pray that our ears are fully open, Lord, to your calling as individuals, as, as your children, but also as your body, this local church. What do you have in store for us this year, Lord? You have been so faithful, so truly faithful to us, Lord, to me. Even when I've been faithless, have you been faithful? So, Lord, we just, we, we ask you, show us. Show us, Lord. And may we remember that this courage that, that is needed to proceed Lord, let us remember that it is already within us. That you have given us a spirit that is not timid. But a bold spirit. A courageous spirit. For you have overcome this world. So we thank you, Lord. For what is, is in the past. But we look expectantly and excitedly for what is in the future. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.